<laughs> I just want to make I, sure. I just figured yeah. I, I'd come up and do uh, the introduction. Yeah. Uh, Isaac Willingham. Yep. He comes up from Christ Church of Westchester, mm -hmm. a place that's common or soon be common to a lot of us. Um, so welcome, Isaac, and yes, thanks thank for you. coming and bringing the word. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good morning. Um, uh, am I on? Is it is good? Okay. Um, as Roger was saying, I'm Isaac Willingham. I'm a pastoral intern at Christ Church Westchester. Um, the passage we'll be studying today is 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 7. So if you'll turn there at this time. Okay. In his address at a prayer meeting, Charles Spurgeon said these words about Genesis 4, 26. It is not essential to the constitution of a congregation, nor is it essential to the formation of a Christian church, that there should be large numbers. It is neither necessary to the devotion nor to the acceptance of it with God that there should be a crowd of people. For the, when there are but twos or threes, only two or three families, then began man to call upon the name of the Lord. Here Spurgeon references that time in history when there were just a few offspring of Adam and Eve, and their sons began to call upon the name of the Lord. In our passage today is my hope that you will see that the preservation of the church starts with prayer. That is rather what this sermon should be called. Whether it be the faithfulness of a church or a search for a pastor who will guide the church, the people of the congregation ought to be a church which prays for all people since the preservation of the church starts with prayer. Our time today will be guided by three points. First, some depart from the faith. Second, a church, first and foremost, prays. And third, one great reason to pray. First, I'll read the passage and then seek to exposit its meaning. Let us pray. Father, gracious Lord, we pray at this time that you may open up the meaning of this passage, that all may know your will for their lives, and that we as a church may become more prayerful as you've urged us to do so here. In Christ's name, amen. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. The Ephesian church was being tossed to and fro by the wind and waves of false doctrine. They needed a beacon of light to guide them ashore to solid ground and enjoy the peace of land. Paul writes Timothy so that they may have an anchor and may make it to dry land. Paul tells Timothy to re remain at Ephesus to, so that the Ephesian church may arrive safely. It may seem odd that Paul tests the Ephesian church to pray for all people that they may stay within the faith, Yet that is exactly what we find here. As we work through the passage today, uh, my hope is that you will see that we ought to pray for all people. This command is situated between Paul's discussion on false doctrines and Paul's instruction for elder qualifications. The first and primary thing a church ought to be is a worshiping, praying church, which prays for the good of all nations and those in high positions. The preservation of the church starts with prayer. This brings us to our first point, departure from the faith. We read that here in chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, Paul addresses Timothy, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies, which promote speculation rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. The doctrine which Paul wants Timothy to hold is seen succinctly in chapter 1, verse 15 to 16. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe on him for eternal life. We see the outcome of not holding to this doctrine in chapter 1, beginning in verse 19. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. They made shipwreck of their faith by blaspheming the name of God. 
Paul himself was a blasphemer of God, but was forgiven because he acted in ignorance. Paul promoted the persecution of the church, and he himself stood by and approved Stephen's stoning. Yet God forgave him since he acted in ignorance. These men, on the other hand, knew that Christ died for sinners and still promoted an exclusivism. This is in contrast with God's grace, which extends to sinners who repent and put their faith in Christ. As we can reason from the text, they denied that Christ had come to save sinners. They taught and promoted doctrine contrary to the gospel, and so Paul excommunicated them from the church. Timothy needed to remain at Ephesus to point the Ephesians to the beacon of light, which is Christ in the saving work on the cross. The anchor of their soul and the white light which guides them is Christ himself. He offered himself as a sacrifice that sinners may come to know the grace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And after the passage, we see that Paul gives instruction for men to lift holy hands in prayer and for women to adorn themselves with modesty. He continues on to give instruction for elder qualifications and deacons in chapter 3. So why might this text, our text today, be placed here between a discussion on false doctrines and the qualifications for elders and deacons? We may understand then that the preservation of the church starts with prayer. This brings us to our text today and our second point. A church, first and foremost, prays. Paul says in chapter 2, verse 1, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. This is the first charge that Paul gives to the Ephesian church as a whole. They are to, first of all, offer prayers, supplications, intercessions, and thanksgivings for all people. You may notice that Paul says here, all people, and that earlier in chapter 1, he says that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. We know that there is not one person in the world that is not a sinner, Paul tells us in Romans 3 that none is righteous, no, not one. There is no fear of God before their eyes. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. All people here is inclusive of everyone who is a sinner, which is everyone. When we pray for everyone, we are praying in accordance with God's will. If we are looking to reform our church's worship life, we need to look first and see if our church is praying together. The first thing to do for the preservation of the church is to pray, not necessarily to get things done. If you are looking for a pastor, first pray and seek a pastor who emulates what Paul, what Paul sets forth here. That is someone who prays for all people, for kings and those who are in high positions. We may notice here that this letter is directed to Timothy first and foremost. As a pastor instantiated by Paul to lead the Ephesian church, Timothy needed to know instruction as how to guide the church that they may be faithful to God. Secondly, this letter would have been read to the, read to the Ephesians since Paul is not addressing matters particular to Timothy, but to the church as a whole. Paul says in other letters for him to read his letters aloud to the church. We may be confident that the Ephesians would have known this letter and that Timothy would have been held to the standard by the church. So when looking for a pastor, the first metric shouldn't be outward appearance, but rather it should be in search of someone who will lead the congregation in corporate prayer, which includes what Paul lays out here. This is his first request of the church and he urges them to be a prayerful church. Therefore, the pastors who lead themselves must be prayerful themselves that the church may be in line with God's will and may be preserved. This brings up the important point that, God, that Paul was urging them to pray for the emperor Nero, who specifically persecuted Christians. What this means is that Paul urges them to pray for the emperor, even though he persecuted Christians later on, that they may lead peaceful and quiet lives, godly and dignified in every way. We should do the same in our own day. We may take for granted that we have a government which allows free Christian worship. We ought to pray that this may be sustained by politicians who will fight for the freedom to worship. Although these same politicians may be averse to Christianity or execute policies that we disagree with, we still need to pray for them that they may govern in such a way as to bring peace and may live, and that we may live godly and dignified lives in the present age. This even includes politicians that we did not vote for. But here we may ask, with respect to what our prayers contain, what does Paul mean by supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings? What are each of these components of prayer? We may define supplications as requests for specific needs, and prayers as bringing those in view before God, and intercessions as appealing boldly on their behalf, and thanksgiving as thankfulness for them. All these constitute one and the same action of praying on behalf of all people, these may be defined separately, but they are done in one and the same action of going before God for requests for specific needs in the world and for prayers on behalf of others. 
Paul continues, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet, quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Here we see that we are to pray for kings and those who are in high positions. We also see the two reasons why we pray are that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way, and because God our Savior desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. These reasons ought, ought to drive the content of our prayers as well. This is where our doctrines and our devotions meet. Since God desires all people to be saved, our prayers should be driven by a desire that people we pray for would be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Our firmly held doctrine that Christ became man to save sinners will be our anchor and our guiding light. We'll be grounded in the truth and be unable to be tossed to and fro by the wind and waves of false teaching. And we have a guiding light to bring us ashore. Paul grounds our prayers in the fact that God's own disposition toward all people is that they would be saved. He is described as God our Savior. God in Christ reconciles us to himself, that we may be saved from our, from our sin and from an eternal hell of punishment. Yet here you may ask, how can I be saved if I've been living in sin for so long? You may look nowhere else than other than the gracious offering in Jesus Christ. We teach that Jesus died to save sinners and for no other reason. His main purpose in coming to the world was to reconcile sinners back to himself. This was Paul's main mission, the mission given to him by God. You may then ask, how do I receive this grace from the Lord? That is the most simple thing you can do. Simply receive it and be blessed by the Lord. Turning from your sin and looking to, the, to Christ is the process by which this grace works. Turn from your sin and believe on Jesus Christ and confess him as Lord today, and you will be saved. Repentance is turning 180 degrees away from your sin and looking to Christ. It is the giving up of sin and trusting in him. To have faith in him is to entrust yourself to him that he indeed died for your sins and will bring you safely into his heavenly kingdom. If this does not describe you now, know that an eternal hell of punishment awaits those who persist in sin and do not trust Christ to take their sins from them. I'm sure anyone here would love to talk to you about this grace of God which was manifested in Christ after the service. Talk to me or any other members about here about what it looks like to believe on the Lord and be saved. You will see what a gracious disposition the Lord has to his children and who the Lord is as we work through this passage. But believe now and be saved that you may have eternal life. Next, we see the motivation part behind our prayers is that we may lead peaceful and quiet lives, godly and dignified in every way. This kind of living is good and pleasing in the sight of God. In this way, we can witness to those around us about the good news. Our lives should be those that necessarily raise curiosity about our hope in Christ, which will leave uh, room for us to witness about Christ. Peter says in 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do so with gentleness and respect. Jesus himself says to let our light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to God the Father who is in heaven. So here's a twofold mo motivation behind our, behind our prayers. God desires all people to be saved, and we want to live lives which glorify God which necessarily will lead to chances to share God's salvation in Christ to others. Our prayers are a pregnant offering before the Lord, and they are pleasing in His sight since we are acting in accordance with His own nature and disposition toward mankind. The reason Paul wants us to pray is because it is pleasing in the sight of God. There is really no greater standard to appeal to. We pray because it is God's will and it pleases Him. God hasn't set the earth in its rotation and interactions we have with other people like a clock, with its mechanisms turning. No, the Lord has, general, has genuine interaction with his creation. Otherwise, he would not have sent the Son to die on the cross for sinners. In the same way that he interacted with us through Christ, so now he interacts with us through prayer. When we pray to the Lord, we are doing exactly what he wants us to do, and it is pleasing in his sight. God likes to interact with the world and affect outcomes through our prayers. We can pray these prayers for anyone, since we know that no one is outside the Lord's saving power. Paul already proved this to us when he said that the Lord displayed his perfect patience for him as the foremost of sinners. If the Lord can save Paul, then he can save anyone, so, that we, so we must pray that this might be so. Specifically to those we interact with throughout the week and for our leaders in government, as Paul mentions here. A question we could ask ourselves is this. Do I pray for our elected officials, 
so that we may lead lives of holiness and wisdom and peace, or we can freely share the gospel. We need to pray for our legislators, that they will produce legislation and enforce laws which are according to his will. Paul says here that we need to pray for kings and all who are in high positions. It is a pleasing sight to God and that we, that we pray for our elected officials, that the world even now, though it is in a sinful state and rebellion to God, may be brought to further peace through our prayers. Paul explains that it is those who are in high positions are, are who we ought to pray for. The reason for this is that those who are in high positions have influence over our daily lives. We vote for these leaders that they may lead us and may bring us to bring to peace upon land. They have influence and exercise their powers as governors and presidents and kings by the authority which God gives them. Therefore, it is right for God to want them to govern with the intent that they may bring peaceful policies and ordinances. This is why God wants us to pray for them. Since when we pray for them, we are praying to go according to God's will, which is for them to govern it with the goal of peace. We also need to pray for the people we rub shoulders with at work on a day-to-day basis. Our hearts will be in alignment with God's when this is the case. And we don't need to miss the similarity we see in verse 1 and verse 4. In verse 1, Paul says that we need to pray for all people. And in verse 4, he says that God desires for all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. That's God's heartbeat, and that's why Paul urges us to pray. When we pray for all people, we are acting in one heart and in one mind with our Creator. Does this shape your prayer life? Does Christ giving himself up for my sins so that God would not exert his wrath on me affect my prayers for other people? It's like the dynamic in the greatest commandment. We love God and neighbor. If we love God and neighbor, we will pray for our neighbor. If this is the driving motive behind my prayers, then I should find myself praying for every nation and their good, and my co-workers, and their good. Is my being known by the one God and His Son who He sent to die for our sins active in my prayer life? A knowledge of this should produce a reprioritization, not only of my prayer life, but also of my schedule. There should be set times to pray throughout the day, whether it be morning or evening, or whatever works in your schedule. You can even pray in your car, so long as your eyes are open. You can pray, you can pray, you can pray with your eyes open when you're, ta- when you're taking a walk or on your way to work. Some of us have learned the secret, but it can take time to get used to. Paul tells us to pray without ceasing, so God will hear these prayers too. We wouldn't be able to pray without ceasing if we had our eyes closed every time we prayed. Our daily life should be filled with these prayers for people so that, we can experience, so that they can experience the blessings of God. Corporately, it should be the same message. And I can say with confidence that this is why we take time out of the service to pause and pray for our missionaries and our elected officials. This is good and pleasing in the sight of God, and it must continue that we may be faithful to God, His Word, and to be protected from false doctrine that may creep into the church. There is a quote from the Grand Rapids Report about corporate prayer that is especially apt here. It follows, We resolve ourselves and call upon churches to take much more seriously the period of intercession and public worship, to think in terms of 10 or 15 minutes rather than 5, to invite lay people to share in leading, since they often have deep insight into the world's needs, and to focus our prayers on the evangelization of the world, closed lands, resistant peoples, missionaries, national churches, etc., and on the quest for peace and justice in the world, places of tension and conflict, deliverance from the nuclear horror, rulers and governments, the poor and needy, etc. We long to see every Christian congregation bowing down in, in expectant faith before our sovereign Lord. This quote is especially apt in the call for corporate prayer, whether it be by the elders or a time in prayer as a congregation on a designated night of the week. So this brings us to our third point, a great reason to pray. Paul goes on in verse 5, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Since God is the one God over all people, then we should include all people in our prayers. If there is one God over all mankind, then the church's prayers cannot be limited to those we are familiar with. It's a pretty basic principle, but it's wide-reaching in its effects. When our affections are similar to that of the one God, we as a church and as individuals will find ourselves desiring that all will taste and see that the Lord is good, as we have in our own salvation. What Paul is doing here is working down from God to man. He is giving us the reason why we pray to God. It is because God in Christ came to earth to preach the good news of salvation. God purposed before all time to save sinners through Christ, and that is exactly what he did. 
Christ now stands at the right hand of the Father and is interceding for us on behalf of his own atonement he made on the cross. That is why we read in the next verse, who, that is Christ, gave himself as a ransom for all. Since God, since God is one, and Christ Jesus is the second person of the Godhead, we now pray through Christ, who offered himself up as a sacrifice, that we may be saved and heard by God. It is by the Holy Spirit, through Christ, that we pray to God the Father. Therefore, you may be confident that the Lord hears your prayers, and will willingly hear what you have to say, if you pray according to his will. We may be confident that we are praying to according to his will if we are praying for all people, for kings and those who are in high positions. We also must acknowledge that Paul here says that God is one. Since God is one, there is no other we may pray to that action may be taken in the world for peace and the spread of the gospel. This, that God is one, would have been well known by the Jews at the time. Deuteronomy 6.4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, is, the Lord is one. In Isaiah 45.5 we read from God that, I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. There is not a pantheon of gods, as some religions believe, and like the Greeks would have believed at the time. It was necessary for Paul to make this statement that the Greeks may understand that there is no other God. Therefore, there is only one God to pray to. There is also another reason why Paul needs to say this. The reason is that since God is one, this means that all humanity finds their source and salvation in him. All people find their source of life in God and find their salvation in Him through Christ. The exclusiveness of God, that is, since God is one, leads to the inclusiveness of all, that, humanity, that all humanity is saved by the one God. It is important to know Christ as mediator, since there is only one mediator between God and man. Christ became man that He may redeem us body and soul. Christ was with God in the beginning and became man in time to redeem man. He is the one who took sin upon himself. No other can take upon the punishment of sin, which is eternal death, other than the one who is eternal in, be in the beginning. One church father said that what he has not assumed, he, he has not redeemed. What he means here is that if Christ did not assume a human nature, then he could not redeem us in our human nature. Christ took on flesh that he may mediate for us. Job's plea before God is great here. There is no arbiter between us who might lay his hand on us both. Yet Christ came exactly to do that, to lay his hand on both God and man that they may be reconciled. We may also address what Paul here means by all. Does he just mean God's elect here? Or does he mean a universalistic salvation of people no matter who they are? I think rather what Paul means here is that every tribe, language, and nation are ransomed through faith in Christ. We can see this by what he says at the end of the section. He says that he is a teacher of Gentiles in, tr in faith and truth. Here we see that Paul the apostle, is the apostle of the Gentiles, which means nations. Christ died as a ransom that all who hear the message of salvation from every nation may be reconciled to God through faith. There is an emphasis throughout this section on all people. Know that, notice that, all, that prayers are to be made for all people in verse 1. God desires all people to be saved in verse 4. And Christ died as a ransom for all in verse 6. Paul is highlighting here that it is not an exclusive salvation to the Jews or to any other type of people that God saves, but rather it is to every type of person in the world. Christ gave himself as a ransom primarily that sinners would come to saving faith, but also so that believers might pray for that which is God's will, that there be peace in the nations, that the gospel may flourish in a dark world. Here we see the gracious disposition of God, that although God can enact all these things by his sovereign will, that is, bring peace that we may live godly lives, he still wants us to participate with him. We may have confidence that since Christ stands to intercede on our behalf, he will hear the prayers. We know from Revelation 5.8 that our prayers are like bowls full of incense before God. And, and God through Paul also encourages us to pray without ceasing, and that we ought to remain steadfast in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. It is highlighted even further here that God himself, the one God who sent Christ as a sacrificial lamb, wants the church at Ephesus to pray for all people. The preservation of the church starts with prayer, so God commands the church to pray for all people. Finally, Paul says, For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of Gentiles in faith and truth. Here Paul says that the reason he is a preacher and an apostle is to witness to the testimony which was given at the proper time. Galatians tells us that Christ came in the fullness of time, and we know that he appointed the apostles to preach the good news to the Jews, and for Paul to preach to the Gentiles in particular. 
Here Paul describes himself as a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. These three aspects comprise his ministry. We can see the magnitude of his ministry by the interjection by Paul that he is not lying but telling the truth. He is saying that the magnitude which he witnesses to, namely that Christ is the one mediator between God and man and that he died as a ransom for all, is so great that someone may assume that he is lying. Here he is asking the church to trust him, that they may also participate in the witness to the great truth of God's salvation in Christ. This is the reason why we must pray for all, because God is one God over all, and Christ is the one Savior of all men. God has an interest in saving all men, so we should say in the same concern. This is not a presumptuous thing, but rather is a faithful thing. God gives us this command here that we may walk according to his will, and it is God's will that we pray for all people. We may ask here if we, if we pray for our elected officials and the officials of other countries during our time of corporate prayer. Do we pray for one another? Do we pray for our missionaries in other countries, in countries where the gospel is restricted by overreaching countries or uh, governments in countries where it is not? Do we pray for the conversion of souls in our neighborhoods, in our schools, and in the workplace? Do we pray for countries that are facing disaster and war, such as Ukraine and Israel? and those that are facing natural disasters, such as Japan? Do we pray for our local hospitals and those in, that they may have speedy recoveries? Do we pray that God would have an intervening hand in all these things, that there may be peace and we may live godly lives? Christ himself gave himself as a ransom for all, that all who hear the message of salvation may be saved through faith in Christ. This, Paul says, is the testimony given at the proper time. He did not die for the righteous, but for the unrighteous, Therefore, it is pertinent to proclaim this message to all that they may turn from their sin and look to God. And this includes everyone. Everyone who is a sinner is qualified for the grace of God so long as they hear the message of Christ, turn from their sin, and believe on the Lord. In our text today, Paul appeals to the church at Ephesus to pray for all people. First of all, that they may be protected from false doctrine and that they may be in line with God's will, which is for them to pray. Paul highlights this command so that the church at Ephesus may be preserved. The church's preservation starts with prayer. This same message is the one we must hear today. Paul sets this first to the churches even before the appointment of elders, showing the primacy of prayer in the life of the church. He appeals to the fact that God is one God. There is no other, and there is no other mediator between God and man other than Christ Jesus who became man to reconcile them back to the Father. The testimony to this was given in the time of the apostles and continues on to this day. Paul was appointed a preacher for this reason, the most excellent appointment one could have, to proclaim the excellencies of God in Jesus Christ to the nations in faith and truth. Paul utilizes this doctrine to pack his claim that the churches, first of all, must pray for all people, since God is the only one who can produce legitimate change in the world. Our prayers are a way in which God enacts his sovereign will in the world, and he commands us to do so because Christ is the only mediator between God and man. Christ died that people from every tribe, tongue, and nation may be saved. So let us pray for all people. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the word which you have given us today. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us, with this church, and empower them to be a prayerful church which seeks to do your will in all things. Lord, imprint your words upon our hearts that we may do your will. In Christ's name, amen.